Thought experiments have existed for all of recorded history and probably long before that. For as long as humans have had the ability to conceptualize thoughts, we've been thinking about pointless things that don't actually matter at all. That you're probably likely familiar with the trolley problem, which a runaway trolley is going to run over high people. The the options are pull a lever and switch the track and have it only run over one person instead. And look, there are countless variations to the scenario to try and make it even more ethically confusing for the person trying to answer. I would say, pointless problems. Now, obviously, this sort of scenario doesn't hold up to any sort of logical scrutiny. How did all of those people get tied to train tracks without anyone trying to intervene? Why is the track switcher so readily accessible by a random pedestrian such as yourself? Is anybody checking CCTV footage to actually track down the psychopath who tied these people up? No. And there are answers to these questions because it's not intended to be realistic. It's just supposed to make you question your morality. But not all thought experiments are nebulous constructs about ethics. Oh, no. No, before Euclidean mathematics placed an emphasis on showing your work instead of just making sure that people got the gist of it, thought experiments were used as an early form of mathematical proof. Thought experiments can deal with issues of biology, physics, economics, and in the case of today's example, our own existence. So sit back, relax, and prepare to be horrified into a permanent state of existential dread as we explain why you probably don't exist. inside the matrix. So, what exactly is simulation theory? Well, the idea is actually pretty simple. The entire universe is just a big old simulation being run on a computer of unimaginable power. In this scenario, nothing about this reality, including you, Peter, is real. It's a lot like the Matrix, except there's no a red pill you can swallow to wake up and discover the world outside the simulation because, well, you don't have a body. You never did. Your entire existence has always been a bunch of ones and zeros inside a computer program. No slimy rebirth for you. Now, the idea that all life is an illusion isn't a new one, and this sort of thought experiment dates back thousands of years. However, the more modern iteration that many people are familiar with was created in 2003 by philosopher Nick Bostrom and published in Philosophical Quarterly, because even philosophers have their own trade publications. In his essay, Are You Living in a Computer Simulation?, Bostrom presented a trilemma that he called the simulation argument. Now, it does not explicitly argue that we are living in a simulation, it just argues that one of three extremely unlikely things almost certainly must be true, hence the word trilemma, which was entirely new to me before today's video. The three options, as put forth by Bostrom, are number one, the fraction of human level civilizations that reach a post human stage, that is, one capable of running high fidelity ancestor simulations, is very close to zero. Number two, the fraction of post human civilizations that are interested in running simulations of their evolutionary history or variations thereof is very close to zero. Number three, the fraction of all people with our kind of experiences that are living in a simulation is very close to one. So, either technology will never advance to the point where oh, we could create a complete simulated world, we will be able to but never want to, or most people aren't living in a simulation. Now, each of these by themselves is pretty unlikely, but they are also mutually exclusive, so one of them has to be correct. This argument can be further extended in a group of three logical premises that point in the direction of reality being a simulation. The first premise is that at some point in the future, technology will advance such that we can create a simulation of reality that is indistinguishable from actual reality. That's almost certainly true. Technology keeps improving, and things that were once seen as impossible are now absolutely commonplace. Now, the good news is that this is clearly a long way off in the distance. The amount of computing power we would need to simulate the entire universe is, as you might guess, massive. It may require some sort of quantum supercomputer that's the size of an entire planet. But the thing is, technology will definitely make this possible. I mean, just think of your favorite video game franchise, be it The Sims, Resident Evil, or Super Smash Bros. Unless your favorite franchise happens to be Madden Football for some reason, with each new game you can see there is some sort of incremental improvement. The improvements don't have to be massive from one generation to the next, but as long as it keeps improving, 
improving, then given enough time, we will eventually get there. It's like how, given infinite time, a million monkeys and a million computers would eventually create Skynet. Now, unless humanity goes extinct first, it is safe to assume that this premise is correct. So the second premise is a simple one, which is that there will be no hindrances to us creating this technology. This means that people will want to create it, and there won't be anything artificial put in place to stop it from happening. Something like legislation implementing a ban on artificial or simulated consciousness would obviously be a major roadblock, assuming it is actually obeyed. Now, this premise is a bit harder to gauge. Generally speaking, civilization sort of has a f around and find out attitude when it comes to, you know, pretty much any scientific advancement, though there have also been important exceptions. Most notably, a lot of people don't like the idea of letting scientists play God. Except, you know, when it comes to killing people, then it's totally cool. <laughs> Human cloning has been deemed bad, and potentially life-saving stem cell research was highly controversial, but nuclear weapons? Well, they were absolutely necessary for us to create, right? That's fine. Go for it, scientists. How many people die? Oh, oh no. And when it comes to creating and prolonging life, sometimes there is pushback. But will this extend to artificial life? Uh, I also, uh, yeah, probably not. Any artificial barriers to creating simulated life would likely have less to do with morality and more to do with fear. And there's a good chance those fears would no longer exist. The amount of technological progress required to build such a simulation is absolutely staggering, and we should have developed general AI long before this is ever possible. Assuming we had already created general AI and learned to live alongside it instead of either being enslaved or exterminated by it, then there probably wouldn't be any reason to restrict the creation of these simulations. Unless, of course, people are so afraid that they actually could be living in a simulation that they would prohibit the creation of such technology. Okay, so this brings us to our third and final premise. The final premise is that this hypothetical future civilization would want to run ancestor simulations where they recreate people like us to a sufficient degree. This seems totally reasonable. There are a lot of reasons people would want to do this, either for research, sheer scientific curiosity or well just for the hell of it because we can and the reality is that when something is possible someone is probably going to do it there may not be any logical or practical reason to do so but just being able to say you did the thing is apparently reason enough you can find countless examples across the internet of people doing insane stupid or seemingly pointless things just to be able to say that they did so all three of our premises do make logical sense. Building a simulation of life should eventually be possible. It is unlikely that doing so would somehow be prevented, and someone would have a reason to do so, even if doing so was the reason in and of itself. Eventually, a simulation of real life complete with artificial humans that think they're real will be possible and implemented. Well, so what the hell does that have to do with you and me? The Downward Spiral. All right, so we've accepted that a simulated reality will be possible at some point, but what happens then? Well, one possibility is that the computer running the simulation is so powerful that it could run millions or even billions of these simulations simultaneously. If this is the case, then the odds of us living in base reality instead of the oh, one of billions of simulations is vanishingly small. But we're going to ignore this scenario because well, it's less interesting. Besides, if these are meant to be true ancestor simulators, then theoretically all of the program should be identical anyway. Running multiple of them concurrently would kind of be pointless. Instead, let's look at the more interesting scenario that still yields the same result. We create an ancestor simulator and allow it to run for thousands of years, or maybe it can simulate thousands of years in like 20 minutes and the people inside just perceive everything as if it was happening within the normal flow of time. That's probably more realistic and somehow even more terrifying. Anyway, eventually that simulated civilization is going to reach the point in their technological advancement where they they can create a simulated reality as well. They begin running their simulation and it too reaches the point where it can create its own simulation. Repeat this ad infinitum and uh, once again we have billions of simulated realities all nested inside the singular base reality, leaving it extremely unlikely that you and I are genuine fleshy bits in the real world. Now before we get to criticisms of simulation theory, of which there are unsurprisingly many, is is there any actual evidence that we're living in a simulation? And surprisingly, the answer to that is yes. Well, 
sort of. Look, every computer simulation has an artifact of the computer's processing speed in it. For example, in the simulator world of GTA, there are the laws of the artificial universe. The game has its physics engine, and barring glitches or exploits, everything that happens within the game is subject to the laws of that physics engine. Cars can't drive through the air, bullets hurt people, and gravity goes down. But every action that exists is also constrained by an unseen force that is separate from the laws of the universe, and that's the processor speed. Nothing that happens can happen faster than the computer can process it. The maximum speed exists as an artifact in every computer process. So, what in our universe is an unmalleable trait of everything that exists, an upper bound that cannot be explained by any laws of physics and must simply be accepted as a given value and something that is considered an absolute with zero exceptions. And you've probably got it already, but of course uh, we're talking about the speed of light. Nothing in our universe can ever exceed the speed of light because that is the maximum processing speed of the computer that is running our simulated reality. Or maybe it's because of the sciencey stuff that smart chaps like Einstein and Hawking try to explain to us all. It's not the most compelling evidence for simulation theory, but it could still technically be considered evidence. Criticisms There are a lot of criticisms surrounding simulation theory. Many scientists essentially denounce it as bullshit pseudoscience and a waste of time, which isn't necessarily unfair. After all, it was a thought experiment published in a philosophy magazine, not a scientific research paper. A big part of what makes this whole thing not really science is that it's completely unfalsifiable. There is no way to prove it one way or the other, which is not a good basis for a scientific theory. It doesn't help that the theory allows for moving goalposts either. Someone could argue that the amount of memory required for a computer to simulate the universe is simply impossible. Indeed, given current technology, there wouldn't be enough atoms in the universe to build the necessary RAM to run such a program. But that's kind of okay, because maybe our simulation doesn't actually need to render the entire universe at once. Maybe you're the main character in this simulation, and nothing exists unless it is in your direct line of sight. Scientists may have told you all of this stuff about subatomic particles and cosmic bodies, but have you actually seen them yourself? If not, there's no reason to waste precious computer resources making sure all of those things actually exist. Exist. As interesting a thought experiment as it may be, there's a lot to criticize. But that's not to say that there aren't high-profile supporters of simulation theory. Elon Musk has repeatedly showed his support for the theory in the past. Then again, Elon Musk has said a whole lot of stuff about Mars and Hyperloop as well. So let's just take his opinion with a grain of salt. But in terms of actual scientists, there's also Neil deGrasse Tyson. Even though the theory is unfalsifiable and therefore not really realistic, Tyson still found the premise to be compelling. He seems seemed genuinely disturbed by the idea and requested anyone to give him a strong argument against it. And that argument would come from his friend J. Richard Gott out of Princeton University. Uh, let's assume that the premises are true and there are or will be billions of simulated realities. According to Gott, that doesn't mean that we almost definitely aren't real. It just makes it a coin toss. In the scenario where humanity creates a single simulation and then that creates a simulation and so on, there is something every universe has in common whether they are real or simulated. They have the ability to create a simulated reality. But we don't have that technology yet, which would leave us one of only two options. Either we are in the base reality, or we are the most recently simulated universe and just haven't got to the point of creating a simulation yet. Even if we're separated from base reality by a billion levels of simulation, we couldn't possibly be in any of those other levels because we can't create our own simulation yet. In the words of Ricky Bobby, either we're first or we're last. So, are we living in a simulation? If you agree with the premises of the argument and their inevitable conclusion, then there is at least a 50% chance that yes, we are. But in the end, it doesn't really make any difference. Even if our consciousness is only simulated, it still feels real to us. Since there will never be any way to prove the theory one way or the other, it doesn't really make any practical difference. Besides, even if we are simulated, we may still be real, or rather, we may have been real. Rather than simulating a universe in some sort of game, it's often put forth as an ancestor simulator to see what life was like in the past. Records from thousands of years ago are sparse, but there's lots of information about people today. If if the point was to accurately simulate people's ancestors, there's a good chance that you're a simulation of your fleshy doppelganger living the exact same life they did. Is that conclusion a bit of a stretch? Well, maybe. But, well, so's the whole idea, isn't it?